Hi, and welcome back to AP Daily. I am Maureen Jimenez, and I'm going to help you with AP Biology free response questions. So here we go. In eukaryotic microorganisms, the FO signaling pathway regulates the expression of certain genes. These genes, the FO target genes, encode proteins involved in regulating phosphate homeostasis. When the level of extracellular inorganic phosphate is high, the transcriptional activator FO4 is phosphorylated by a complex of two proteins, the FO80 and FO85. As a result, the FO target genes are not expressed. When the level of extracellular phosphate is low, the activity of FO80 and FO85 complex is inhibited by another protein, the FO81. And this enables the FO4 to induce the expression of these target genes. So a simplified model of this pathway is shown in figure one. And figure one has a, an A pathway with high phosphate environment and B with low phosphate environment. In the high phosphate environment, we see that the FO4 is going to be phosphorylated by the FO80, FO85 complex, and therefore it's not going to interact with those target genes. In the low phosphate environment, that FO81 is going to inhibit that FO80, FO85 complex, and therefore the FO4 can interact with those target genes, and it's going to encode those target genes into proteins. The prompt goes on to say that the, to study the role of the different proteins in the FO pathway, researchers used a wild type strain of yeast to create a strain with a mutant form of FO81 and a strain with a mutated form of the FO4. In each of these mutant strains, researchers measured the activity of a particular enzyme, the APase, which removes phosphates from its substrates and is encoded by FO1 a FO target gene. They then determined the level of FO1 mRNA relative to that of the wild type yeast strain, which was set to 10. So in this table, it's got a lot of information. It's got the APase activity and relative amounts of FO1 mRNA in wild type and mutant strains of yeast in both the high and low phosphate environments. We'll be using this in some of those breakdowns of the prompts to answer the question. In part A, it says to describe the effect the addition of a charged phosphate group can have on a protein that would cause the protein to become inactive. The scoring guideline is looking for it changes the structure or shape of the protein. Part A also wants you to explain how a signal can be amplified during signal transduction in a pathway such as the FO signaling pathway. Each enzyme in a signal transduction pathway can act on many copies of a protein. So in the student response, they did describe the effect by writing that the charged phosphate group likely changes the tertiary folding structure of a protein. But for the explain, as far as amplification, they did not quite get there in their response. So they did earn one point for part A in the description, but did not get the explanation. In part B, it says, based on table one, identify a dependent variable in the researcher's experiment. We can accept one of the following, either looking for the APase activity that we're measuring or the relative amount of the FO1 mRNA that also is being measured. Part B goes on to justify the researchers using the wild type strain for the creation of the mutant strains. So we can accept one of the following. It ensures that any observed differences between the strains are due to the introduced mutation, or it ensures that the strains are genetically identical except for the introduced mutations. Part B has another justify. So justify the researcher using mutant strains in which only a single component of the pathway was mutated in each strain. We can accept one of the following. It allows them to test the effect of each mutation separately, or it allows them to better determine which component is responsible for any observed differences. In the student response, they did get the description, looking at the activity of the APase. They did get justify, uh, the researcher using the wild type. Um, only mutation is one they induced. And also the second justify, because it was caused by that one mutation since everything else was the same. So they earn a point for um, the identify and also both justifications. 
In Part C, based on the data in Table 1, identify the yeast strain and growth conditions that led to the highest relative amount of FO1 mRNA. So specifically, we're looking at the uh, FO mRNA in the high phosphate environment and also the low phosphate environment. Based on that, the wild type yeast in the low phosphate environment is going to have that highest amount. Part C also wants to calculate the percent change in APACE activity in the wild type yeast cells in a high phosphate environment and also that of the low phosphate environment. When that calculation is done, um, regardless of which one came first, the high or the low phosphate in that setup, uh, each of them was accepted. So we could see that we have 3,360% or a negative 97% when we are comparing that high and low environment. In the student response, they did get the identify as far as the wild type yeast in the low phosphate environment and also the calculation, you can see the setup there and leading to that 3,360%. So they got the point for both parts, identify and also calculating. In part D, uh, it says in a follow-up experiment, researchers created a strain of yeast with a mutation that results in a non-functional FO85 protein. Based on figure one, predict the effects of this mutation on the FO1 expression. So we see that the arrow there is showing the FO85 as being the non-functional protein, and we're going to predict what would happen. If that was mutated, then it would not interact with the FO4 to phosphorylate it, so that pathway would not happen, and we would be able to predict and expect that those proteins encoded by the FO target genes will in fact be made. So the scoring guideline wants it, uh, it or the FO1 or the target genes will be expressed. Part D also goes on to provide reasoning to justify your prediction. So again, the scoring guideline is looking for that high phosphate environment, that non-functional FO85 will be unable to phosphorylate or inhibit the FO4. The student response does predict correctly to allow transcription of the FO target genes despite the high phosphate environment. And also the justify, the FO85 would not be able to form that complex and phosphorylize the FO4. So this response does earn the point for predicting and also justification. So overall in this question, the max score was a nine the mean score of all the responses was a 2.8. Some things to take away from that um, as far as misconceptions or gaps in knowledge. For part A, being careful not to use vague terms like phosphorylation cascade because it doesn't indicate amplification. A better response is getting very specific that phosphorylating a protein will activate those proteins in step two. In part B, um, again, with the vagueness as far as served as a control, um, we want to be a little bit more specific. Um, for example, to ensure that no other variables would be changed other than the mutation. There's some other example responses that will demonstrate understanding for Part B as well. In Part C, uh, the miscalculation by choosing the wrong formula, um, whatever that um, you know, there's a lot of pathways with math that can go wrong, um, making sure to use that um, correct calculation to get then um, that response that demonstrates understanding. In part D, uh, again, connecting a loss of dysfunction and a mutation uh, will then uh, fail to phosphorylate the full four. The best response is what we saw even in that student response as far as um, the non-functional four will express that those target genes. Some things to look at and some advice to offer not only teachers but you as the students um, to enhance your performance. Reviewing the stages of cell communication, that's a big one. Um, in the experimental design, looking at various types of controls, there's positive, negative, a baseline for comparison, and making sure to choose the appropriate one. 
and for the science practices to understand the relationship between claim evidence and reasoning overall to help you with your response. You also want to review those task verbs and what they're asking you to do, like the difference between explain and justify and supporting a claim. Overall, I hope this was helpful and get ready to crush your exam.